Welcome to this afternoon's session on implementation of alternatives, challenges, and solutions. Um, my name is Ben Lewis. I'm a human rights officer with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights based in Geneva. I'm within a small team working on uh, migration and human rights. We provide legal and policy advice uh, to the High Commissioner on matters of migration, as well as to um, regional and, and country offices. The Office of the High Commissioner for, for Human Rights has been interested in, in this issue of immigration detention broadly or, or the detention of, of migrants purely for reasons related to their status as an irregular migrant um, for many years and, and specifically to child detention um, at least as early as 2009 or 10. Um, back in, in 2012, we helped to launch together with the International Detention Coalition, as well as the Committee on the Rights of the Child, a global campaign on ending the detention of children, which you've heard about today. Um, and we've, since at least 2012, uh, have consistently said that, um, and agreed with the, the Child Rights Committee, that the detention of children purely for reasons of their status is a discriminatory act that is in violation of the rights of the child and, and contrary uh, to the best interest when they're, when they're placed in, de in detention for reasons related to either their or their parents' migration status. The, the High Commissioner himself has um, actually very progressively called for states to stop resorting to detention in the context of migration control full stop, to sort of return to a time when we weren't detaining people en masse simply for status violations. Of course, there are distinctions to be made for criminal law or institutional care of people that need it, but status-related uh, offenses and the use of detention, I think, is something that the office is generally concerned about, and certainly um, for the use of children, or in the context of children. A number of human rights treaty bodies and special procedures or mandate holders have also addressed the issue, um, notably the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Migrants uh, in 2010 uh, finalized a thematic report on the use of detention where he highlighted the detention of children as, as a, a, a leading cause of rights violations and something to be very concerned about. Uh, in 2015, the Special Rapporteur on Torture went a step further and, and called detention of children purely for reasons related to their or their parents' migration status a particular form of ill treatment of children and in certain contexts amounting to torture itself. So, for example, the use of solitary confinement um, or the use of handcuffs and other criminal-like measures uh, in the context of immigration control for children, he has called tantamount to torture or ill treatment of children. And the practice itself, uh, he said, needs to be very seriously reconsidered. Um, so I wanted to highlight kind of the history of the, the office's work on, on this issue. And then I wanted to remind um, all of us kind of what the human rights framework or what the human rights system uh, obligates states to do vis-a-vis -vis child protection and vis-a-vis -vis the use of detention. And this is sort of basic, but I think it bears repeating that when states become parties to international treaties, such as the Child Rights Convention, or the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which has, uh, enshrines the right to liberty and security of person. Um, when they become parties to those treaties, they, states assume obligations and duties under international law, um, obligations and duties to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. And this is sort of the core element of the human rights system. So, the, the obligation to respect human rights is a negative obligation that states do not themselves engage in behavior which trespasses or, or um, violates the rights of, of people. Um, but there are also positive obligations, uh, typically understood as the protective function uh, or the fulfill function, positive obligations that states have to take actions to prevent violations. So both a negative obligation not to commit violations, but a positive obligation to protect and fulfill uh, the obligations, to protect people from human rights violations. Um, and so in that context, 
the, our office has consistently been calling for what we call human rights-based migration governance policies, human rights-based migration management. That is, of course, manage your borders, of course, govern migration, but do so in a way that respects, protects, and fulfills the human rights of migrants, which is your obligation. Um, and specifically with regards to alternatives to detention, we've been calling upon states not simply, and I think this gets to Michael Flynn's point this morning, which I thought was very provocative and very useful, um, not simply to adopt measures which might be called alternatives to detention, but to adopt rights-based alternatives to detention. As Mike put it, alternatives that um, progressively seek to limit or end the criminalization or the detention of children. That's what the alternatives framework should be about, getting to a point where we stop this practice with children. But from a human rights framing, it would be alternatives which respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights of children and, and migrant children. So, but the, the problem is, or, or part of the challenge, I think, that we'll explore today and has already been explored is that so far, most of the alternatives to detention that are in fact being adopted by states would likely not be considered human rights-based alternatives. That is, their fundamental purpose is not to respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights of child migrants, but it's rather about um, controlling or sometimes even punishing or seeking to deter child migrants. I think there are legal, there are legal arguments that can be made about whether uh, alternatives that seek to punish or deter children from migrating are in and of themselves even legal. Um, but I think there are uh, more important moral and ethical questions. What sort of societies do we want to create? And how do we take steps to protect uh, children that are, that are on our territory or within our jurisdiction? So human rights-based approach to alternative detention, this is the last thing I'll say, um, is one that's normatively based on the obligations that states have underneath their treaties. But it's also, um, a human rights-based approach is also one that operationalizes those commitments. So for example, we were talking over the coffee break this morning with a couple of colleagues. If we say, that, if we acknowledge that we have a, a normative commitment under the CRC to protect uh, and, and enhance or prioritize the best interests of the child, human rights-based migration laws and policies would be laws and policies that say we are committed to protecting the best interest of the child. But that normative commitment is not enough. It must also be operationally put into practice. So it's laws and policies are one thing, but we also need to operationalize the best interest principle. How do we do that? Well, in, in this case, through a best interest uh, assessment or a best interest determination. So specifically adopting practices or policies that um, mandate that your Migration officials, police, best, um, uh, in this context perhaps deportation or detention officials to, to conduct a best interest determination prior to taking actions that um, affect the child. So both normatively based but also operationally guided. Um, and to that end, I think we should hear from our, our panelists. <laughs> We're going to hear both about challenges and opportunities. Um, and I'm very happy to have um, with me two colleagues, one who I've just met, but I have known sort of via the world of, of migration um, and detention for um, six months or, or more since she became a regional coordinator within the International Detention Coalition. Uh, and another who I met, I believe, through the work of the, the CJ Dam or the CDH MIG um, in Cyprus not so long ago. So uh, we're going to start with Eva. Eva Fleger is the Deputy Head of Department for Legal Migration of the Federal Ministry for, uh, of the Interior of Austria. Um, as the Deputy Head of the Department for Legal Migration, she's involved in return-related questions from a human rights perspective, and she has been the Human Rights Coordinator since mid-2014. I hope that introduction did you justice, Ava. She's going to tell us a bit about the basic care concept in Austria, um, steps that Austrian officials have taken to progressively limit the use of detention um, and to prioritize al alternatives, but also some of the challenges I think that they're facing in operationalizing, and I uh, hope that you all will chime in the conversation as well to, uh, to suggest some ways forward. So with that, I turn it over to Eva. 
Thank you, Ben, for the very kind introduction, and thank you for the organization of this conference and inviting me to speak. It's particularly right after lunch. This is, for me, always the most challenging part of the, uh, of the conference to you know, keep my interest up, and so being the one sitting here getting to speak is easy. I have to be focused, and I hope I can um, share our experiences with you and keep it interesting for you. So, um, same of like, similar to the experience of our Dutch colleague who spoke earlier today, through the work of the CDDH MIG, I realized that some things I would, like in my legal schooling, never consider this is an alternative to detention might be considered as such, which is our basic care concept, which is the concept that a person who arrives in Austria to ask for asylum, during their procedure, and even if their claim is denied and they're told, okay, you will have to leave, you will have to go back to your country of origin, they are supported by the state, they are given um, a place to live, they are either given food or they are given money to uh, buy their own food. The children are, of course, sent to school, health care is provided same as an Austrian citizen would be provided. So in, in that sense, that's the prevailing measure for us. As of um, this morning, we have about six, six, 67... <laughs> I'm, no? Thank you. 67,000 people. I asked Ben earlier to help me because I always uh, screw up the numbers. So 67,000 people uh, in this basic care receiving assistance and 278 in detention. And I'm fairly certain there is no minors in detention right now because we, we do catalog all these people. So... But that was not always the case. I'm going to take you back to 2006 now, where we had a new Aliens Police Act, a new law, that where the idea was also, especially for Dublin transfers, we want to make it easier to detain people, because the idea was that will help us to enforce returns. And the policy back then was pretty much already detention of children. That's like, it didn't sit well with anybody. Nobody wanted that. But we did something else that nowadays, um, and I think most people in this room will agree, is not the right approach either. We would detain the father and the mother and the children would you know, be in basic care or would be in an alternative to detention. And so we had a separation of families, which is maybe not the way to go. And that gradually changed to a place where we would put families in alternatives to detention. It, we didn't quite get there until November 2010, when the government made a six points plan. It was caused by the return of a family to Kosovo. Um, to be quite honest, to this day, I don't understand what was so different about that return from many, many other returns that were carried out, but that one um, caused a huge media outcry and made the government rethink the strategy of children in the migration process and children in return as a whole, but especially also for children in detention. And that's when um, we changed our law also, or amended our law in a way that any child under the age of 14, there is an absolute prohibition to put them in detention pending return. And I stress the pending return part because, as I already said, as an asylum seeker, there, you cannot be detained for the reason that you're seeking asylum in Austria. It will always be a detention pending the return or pending the doubling transfer. And so in November 2010, the decision was made to, well, first to actually like signed a practice into law, no more detention of children under the age of 14. And um, in reality, that means also no detention between, very close to the age of 18. I will maybe touch upon that in a little bit. But we also decided that we would have to set up like an an alternative for families where we could have a reporting obligation or we could have a, an, a real and working alternative for detention so that it wouldn't be the case anymore where we say, okay, we, we don't have an alternative, so therefore detention or a separation of the family is the only way to go to ensure the return. So what happened was we, um, the Ministry of Interior uh, took over a piece of property that was owned by the state anyway. It's a um, house full of individual apartments. It used to, originally the house was built as like starter homes for refugees. The idea was if you're granted refugee status, you will have an apartment, you can live there, and then you have some time to find your own home. 
we um, stopped that a while ago, so the house was empty anyway, and it was like, okay, this, this might be the way to go. So it's a house in, on the outs, I will admit on the outskirts of Vienna, but you can still reach it by public transport. You are, you're not stuck there. You have a tram line that goes to the city center every 10, 15 minutes. So it's not the, like, you know, there's many more rural places. And this has become our go-to alternative for detention for families. Or it started out for families, but nowadays it's also used for single males or single women. Um, what we have there is um, individual apartments where, in essence, we have room for two adults and three children in one apartment. The apartment contains two rooms, a small like, kitchenette area um, with microwave and cooking area and, of course, a bathroom. And the uh, people are free to um, leave the place. What, is, what we have as the option for alternatives by law we can tell a person, okay, you have to stay at a designated residence, you might have to report to police at once a day or once every two days, once every three days, depending on the circumstances of the case, or the law foresees the possibility of setting um, a monetary deposit you have to leave with the uh, authority. Now, the, the first two options, the mandatory residence and the reporting to police have been on the law books since at least our Foreigners Act in 1997, and it became much more used um, after 2006 when the law changed. And you can also look at the numbers. The more lenient measures, or sorry, this is the literal translation, the alternatives to detention, they slowly go up, detention slowly goes down. Um, but especially for families and families with children, the alternatives, that they definitely went up if we have to use them at all. And there the uh, reporting measure and the residence measure are sometimes combined also at this facility in Vienna, where the idea is they, they stay there and once a day, like the police has the certainty, yes, they're still there. They're, if, we, if we need them for an interview or one, one time a day between the hours of eight and 10, we know they will be there. We know we can have them available for any administrative steps that might need to be taken. So that is uh, the, the facility in Zindergasse in Vienna. Um, I should also mention that there is an NGO providing assistance to the people, also providing return counseling to the persons who stay there. And the police officers who work there are also all in plain clothes, no, uh, no uniforms, no guns. It's, um, the attempt was made to make it very like low-key, nicer environment and have a positive experience in that sense. And that has um, worked out well, but I do have to say now that we, we have the Zinnergasse, we have this, this experience, um, we do still need detention, especially towards the end of the procedure. Um, when it comes to the return, we also discussed in CDDH MIG, um, alternatives might be on a, applied on a sliding scale approach. You might start with a reporting duty, but then, and the reporting duty is once a week, and then as you get closer, like you now have the enforceable court decision, you now start the process of acquiring the travel documents, you now have the travel documents, you might move the alternative measure from reporting once a week to reporting every second day, because there is now, the migrants obviously also knows, now the government has travel documents for me, so maybe now is the time, if I were to abscond, now is a good time to abscond, because this is the time where the return is closer. So that in our experience, at, at the very end, we have the possibility to detain families in this facility as well for a maximum of 72 hours, which um, is necessary in our view for a few reasons. First of all, if you inform the family, okay, we need to return you, or this is when the flight is booked, this is when the bus will leave, well, there is a very high chance that they will leave or they will, they will not be there the next morning. So that is one reason. The other reason is there is a certain number of required administrative steps. I think we discussed it yesterday. Uh, would it be the better idea to go in at 4 a.m. and wake up the children and say like, okay, now you're going to be put on a plane at 10 a.m.? 
for, to me personally, it's the better, the better of two bad solutions uh, to go in the day before or even one more day before, say, okay, look, you need to be leaving Austria, you will be returned uh, in two days' time now. You're now no longer free, free to leave the premises of this building. And the way it works for us in the Zinnergasse facility is the, the ground level and the first level is used as an alternative to detention. The people are free to leave there at any time. They, um, they just have to um, let the, or do their reporting duty once a day. Usually there it's applied once a day. But then they can move about freely if they are told, okay, now we're, we are arresting you, you cannot leave any longer, they will be moved upstairs to the second or the third floor, but the, other than being moved up, like one level upstairs, the facility is still the same, there is no bars, there is no police officers with guns, no uniforms, there is a room for the children to play, there is a, um, still a playground outside, behind the facility, where there is a tall wall, yes, but there is no barbed wire. So what we tried to do in setting this place up was to make it as, as friendly as possible. I think it's quite similar to the approach we heard earlier from the Netherlands. Um, but I do have to say, without this possibility, I think we would have a big, big problem in actually returning families or make the, the fact of the return worse for the family because th there comes the point in time where you have to put them in the car and take them to the airport. Um, what I also, so as, aside from, from that, and of course in the time where they are detained, they're still free to be visited by a lawyer, and it's also the time where Austria carries out a fit for flight or a fit for travel examination on everybody, and all these steps, they take some time, so in our view, that is still necessary. Now, I talked very much about the practice and what we do. There was one thing, I, because I kept revising my presentation as I was listening to the other presentations given by, by other speakers because there was so much input. One, one thing that I also noted down was in our um, system, before, when we order an alternative to detention, there needs to be grounds for detention. There needs to be a risk of absconding. There, there needs to be a certain factor. It's never just the case, or oh, you're irregularly staying in Austria, or you applied for asylum in Austria. It's always something added, usually towards the end of the procedure. And then if the decision, uh, if the decision is between applying an alternative or the detention, even if the authority comes to the conclusion that it needs to be a detention order, they have to explain in the detention decision why they could not apply an alternative. And this is something our courts will look at, and if, if there's just like sometimes the one word sentence, oh, I, don't, I think this person would abscond, we can be sure the detention decision will be overturned and the person released. So this is something our courts make very sure that we actually look at look at and really think about if an alternative to detention wouldn't work in this case, not only for families or for families with children, but for all migrants. But in particular, this would also apply to unaccompanied minors who I haven't really spoken about yet, because the Austrian law, as I mentioned, prohibits uh, detention of anybody under 14. Between the ages of 14 and 16, um, the legal requirements are basically impossible to fulfill, so in practice we have no detention below the age of 16, and between 16 and 18 there is this um, assumption in the law that an alternative to detention should be applied in any and all cases, uh, but in very special circumstances the authority might still order a detention. Now this is um, hardly ever applied. I can remember one case or maybe two in the last couple of years. Um, but these are then also cases um, that are often related to uh, the fact that a minor is treated as a minor as soon as he says he's under 18 years of age, or she says that, of course, no, no doubt about it. So I, as, as I always tell Austrian police officers, if I were to come and ask for asylum in Austria and I'm telling you I'm 16 years old, you have to treat me as a 16-year-old. And then usually one of them asks, so how many years have you been 16 years old? And I tell them, that doesn't matter. I said I'm 16, so you have to treat me as a 16-year-old. But this is maybe something also we can dis discuss. Uh, this becomes a challenge for us. So we, we treat, you treat me as a 16-year-old. Um, 
then you put me an alternative to detention where I might be together with other children who really are 16 years old. And then there, there come these, um, the challenges of, okay, now how do I, to, how do I take care of both types of children? How, how do I solve that? What do I do in the uh, procedure of age assessment? How do I carry that out? No, no question, I need to be treated as a minor, but it's still, it's the, the practical uh, assessment for states can be quite challenging. But maybe to, to come to some sort of summary, because I promised I would finish a few minutes early. Um, in our practice, alternatives to detention, especially for families, have worked out quite well. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a good way to go, especially since children really don't have a place in a typical detention center. However, at the um, very end, we, at the very end of the procedure, the last hours or the last couple of days, I agree with the assessment from my colleague from the Netherlands, we still need some detention. And as I have four more minutes, might I answer that right away? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And I see so, it's here anyway. So, uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the application of bail, um, we, we actually put that in the law when we implemented the return directive of the uh, European Union because that's one of the uh, possibilities for alternatives of detention suggested in the return directive or by the commission. And already when we, we wrote it in the book, we were kind of like, well, we aren't really sure if this is going to work because at least in our case, most migrants don't have a lot of mo money. So it's, it, it was very, like we, we have it if in case a migrant has money, this is definitely an option. But I think in all the years, um, and we implemented the return directive a bit late in 2012, uh, it's been on the books, it's hardly ever used simply for the fact that the migrant doesn't have money. And so to say, okay, you have to post bail of X amount, and there you cannot do it, therefore now you failed to comply with your alternative to detention, therefore now you go to detention, that would be setting up would be setting up to fail, and that's what we try to avoid. So in this case, it's much more likely that we will tell the person, okay, you have to come to report to police every second day, because that's something you can comply with whether you have money or not. And the police station is also on our law books, has to be in, in proximity to where the person lives. So I couldn't tell somebody who lives in Vorarlberg, our state closest to Switzerland, that they have a reporting duty in Vienna, which is an in the best case, eight hour drive by train every day. So that would be, once again, setting them up to fail. So it needs to be uh, a, a realistic chance that they can actually fulfill that alternative. But if you, you do that, then we're once again at this trust level, it, I think it will work out quite well. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll finish here and I look forward to Katarina and questions. Yeah, why not a round of applause? Someone wants to do so, I guess. <laughs> um, absolutely. Eva, that was fantastic. I have a number of questions. I'll, I'll maybe tick through some of them now, but I'll also remind everyone while we're here and have a bit of time, um, use the Slido uh, app if you want to ask questions and we'll get to them um, throughout. I've, I've got it on my phone as well so I can see kind of what's coming in. Um, a couple of points just to highlight. Um, one, I think this idea of a, a basic care concept, sort of a driving ethos behind the migration regulations is critically important. And I was just in a conference in Oxford with some of the people in this room where the UK uh, ministry talked about how they, their ethos used to be to create a hostile environment for migrants. And now they're moving towards a compliant environment, which I think is better. But how much better would it be to get to a basic care or a protection environment if this was really what we were trying to do with children? So the ethos that drives the migration policy, I found that really interesting. And maybe later on, Eva, you could talk about how you even arrived at that idea um, as a migration division. Um, the role of NGOs and media uh, in putting pressure on you to change, sometimes that's a helpful uh, solution, uh, providing space to, to move things forward, especially when they're stuck. Um, you mentioned if there aren't any alternatives currently in practice, maybe the best thing to do, in fact, a legal obligation is to go out and build them or to go out and find them, um, not build them in a physical sense necessarily, like we need to find places to stick people, but build programs that protect and care for people and, and create compliance or obligations um, that people can comply with uh, without having to resort to, to detention. Um, I wanted to ask a question, and maybe you can get to this later on as well. 
during the earlier presentation, I think there was someone from the Swedish Migration Board, Niklas, who talked about the importance of a holistic approach. And I, and I noticed you talked about reporting to police and uh, immigration officers having a role to play, but I was wondering what role the, the child ministry or the social welfare ministry and others might play. But again, you can put the questions in, in Slido that you're interested in. Those are some of mine. Let me move on because um, I don't want to take up too much time. Let me introduce uh, Katarzyna Slubik, who's a senior lawyer and project coordinator um, for the Association for Legal Intervention in Poland. She's also a member of the European uh, Network on Alternatives to Detention, which is a new network that uh, she'll tell you about in a moment. She's going to talk about the work that, that her organization is undertaking, as well as this European uh, Network on Alternatives to Detention, to shift the focus away from enforcement and towards engagement-based alternatives. Um, through the use of tailored case management approaches. And she's also going to tell you about a project that they have um, called the No Detention Necessary Project. Um, so very interested to hear. It's off to you, Karajina. Thank you, Can I, is, is it okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me and considering our, our ATT network and um, a Polish pilot as um, worthwhile uh, sharing at this great event. Um, we're not only shifting now from enforcement-based projects to uh, approaches to engagement-based ap uh, approaches, but also like from thousands of people in Austrian care to like very, very small pilots implemented by civil society in a couple of uh, European countries. So just be prepared. Um, I'm very happy to pick up where uh, actually Dr. Samson finished her presentation uh, during the previous session. Uh, I'm sure lots of you are familiar with the There Are Alternatives report. Uh, uh, if somebody has not yet read it, then I encourage you to do so. Um, it brings together um, many good practices and develops a model of um, alternatives, an ideal model of alternatives that is based on engagement of a migrant uh, with, you know, indicates uh, several rules that should be kept when we want to have successful alternatives. Um, uh, so um, just take a look at it. It's in the, on the first pages of the report. Um, and I'm, to, I'm raising this issue because this is actually the model that we are in an ATD network working on. Uh, but let's just let me give you a, a quick history of how the network was set up. Uh, so we had this this report, uh, and it was it gave this it presented this model uh, and basically all these guidelines on how to implement alternatives. But still, there was no like visible shift in the what the decision makers were doing. There was no really visible change uh, in uh, from enforcement to engagement. Uh, we didn't see it in, on the level of the states and we didn't see it on the European level. Uh, and it was really getting, uh, it was really becoming frustrating. And out of this frustration, an ATD network was born. Um, so it's a fresh initiative uh, that aims to develop concrete uh, pilots, concrete examples, concrete evidence. Um, that wants to implement small pilots in the countries um, in order to collect evidence and just present it to um, civil society, to decision makers in the, in the countries, in, at the European level, to, to show that, okay, so we have this research and then we have these models that seem perfect, but then again, we also have evidence and concrete examples that support it. Um, so ATD Network was set up in March in 2017, so it's really a fresh initiative. Um, it brings together uh, five uh, civil society organizations in Cyprus, uh, Bulgaria, Poland, and UK, but it's also, uh, it was set up with a huge support of IDC and also PICOM, who is our like European advocate. Um, and all of the national um, organizations are developing very small-scale projects that focus on engagement in the countries that they are based. Um, uh, the project is developed in, with the support, so th there were some questions about financing. So the, the project was, is developed with the financial support of Network of European Foundations, which is quite a comfortable situation as for now. Um, 
Okay, so this is about the network and just let me just give you a quick overview of what we're doing in Poland because this is the project that I'm most familiar with. Um, uh, I would just sh uh, give you a picture of what the rules about the children detention in Poland are. So um, we do have alternatives to detention, but still we are allowed to detain families with children. Um, unaccompanied minors who seek asylum are not being detained, but then unaccompanied minors who do not seek, deten seek asylum are detained if they are over 15 years old. Um, we have lots of families with children in detention. In 2016, it was like 25% of everybody. The children constituted 25% of all detainees in detention centers, so it's quite a high number. Um, so in this... Um, uh, climate, we are implementing our very small project. We focus on people who are in return procedures um, that have been imposed ATDs or that were released from detention centers um, that we managed to release or to get to be released or that were like with a happy coincidence released uh, from detention. Um, and what we do is we give uh, we offer these people a holistic services that are um, aimed at uh, engaging, engaging them in the procedures, um, empowering them, um, making them trust, developing trust in the in the procedures that they are partaking, um, but also we give them legal advice, uh, we support their case resolution, um, we um, assist them where the positive case resolution is not possible, uh, we also offer them psychological support. Uh, if it's necessary. So we work in teams, lawyer, case manager, um, psychologist. We also have a child psychologist. Um, since we only started in June, so we only have now qualified 10 people, 10 adults and 8 children. Uh, we, as we focus on vulnerable persons, and this is like the, what, what the families with children actually are, so we do um, start to see that uh, we need to have these child-specific measures, that we need to focus our special attention on developing like particular safeguards to really give enough sufficient pro protection to the children that are in our, um, in our project. Um, so what we basically do, we've mentioned like case management here and there, like during this conference a lot. So uh, I don't know if you have this, this concept in, in your countries, but it's really not that mainstreamed in Poland uh, for social work as such and for migration management ever at all. So we really are developing tools, uh, trying, what, trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, to, what works with adults, what works with children, um, trying to figure out um, um, like what, pro, what, safeguard we, what safeguards we should put, uh, how people react to what we pr offer them, what, what we're doing. Uh, we, we're keeping very extensive notes and we really want to be able to, at the end of the project, which is two years, uh, to present like uh, not a very stiff model that it can only be taken like in the in the shape that it was created, but to know what worked, what didn't for the specific group, um, uh, what could work for this like similar group, but what would need to be changed if you wanted to wanted to implement it in under diff different circumstances to a different target group. Um, our particular focus is on like. Individual, individual approach. So this is really what comes out of the CAP model and uh, many other publications and recommendation is that um, a person that is in alternatives, that it's in these uh, is taking uh, in, this, in these projects of uh, engagement-based based alternatives, that this is an individual who has his or her own motivations, strategies, dreams, feelings, um, fears, uh, their own health issues, um, their own future and their own past. So um, we really try to f 
figure it out during you know, like by setting up a relationship that is based on trust, but also with clear roles of what we can do and what we can't do for this person, and really figure it out and adjust our offer, um, uh, adjust our assistance in case resolution so that it really fits this person. And maybe just like a few words about to to respond to um, uh, what you were saying about. Um, what the solutions are for people who have to be returned, whether we should keep them in detention, like is it like 24 hours earlier or is it a week earlier? Obviously, I do not have a simple response, but I just have this feeling that the real work really starts like so much earlier that you know that it's really a work to build trust of this person in this procedure, whether they really had all the information about the procedure, whether they really had the all information about what the rights are, what are the possible outcomes, um, whether they really feel that their case has been uh, recognized like fairly timely with all the safeguards. And then, you know, it, so it really starts earlier and we really try to have our interventions, you know, to hold them really early, which is one of the challenges actually. Um, because what we need to do is uh, we basically meet people when they already have alternatives to detention and or they, they are in detention centers. So this is really after many, many procedures that they had in Poland. Um, yeah, but this, this is what we we try to to also figure out now um, um yeah i guess that would be it is it oh, no. that was sure okay so maybe a bit about you know how to how we approach children we're a bit in the process of figuring some also some things out but we obviously have a child protection policy and we have a child psychologist um and um what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to figure out um whether they should be, there should be like strict rules about approaching each child that we encounter, that we qualify to the project, or whether it should be really case by case uh, decided, you know, after we meet the person, whether we should really give the voice to each child that we meet, or whether it should be only when we feel that maybe a parent is not acting in the best interest of the child. So this is the, the, these are the issues that we're trying to figure out, and we will definitely put it into recommendations after the project. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Karajina. You, yeah. <laughs> Again, I have lots of questions, and we've got a, uh, we've got a little bit more time with your presentation. So I'm going to take liberties uh, while you're thinking of questions. And I want to, before I put some more questions to Karajina about her specific project, maybe just to encourage the conversation that's going to come. I would love to facilitate a really open, honest but respectful conversation about the challenges and solutions. I mean, I think we started to scratch the surface, but let's scratch deeper, um, especially those of you that are working within ministries of interior that are dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, let's be honest about the challenges. You've got pressure to have compliance with immigration laws. Sometimes you like those laws, sometimes you don't, but either way, your job is to get compliance. Um, Sometimes your laws themselves allow for, or even encourage, uh, as you see in the EU returns communication, increased attention, for example. So how, what are the challenges? Let's talk about that. Um, and then for those of us that are practitioners, uh, well, including the, the ministries themselves, but practitioners, uh, researchers, what are the solutions? I wanted to highlight a number of things that, that Karajina um, brought up. I mean, this idea of building trust, um, and engagement as one of the key solutions perhaps in actually getting to compliance. Maybe this is a key strategy for uh, addressing some of the challenges. But very quickly, just some other details, Karajina, about your program. One, you, you mentioned quickly a psychologist, uh, social workers. Who else is on your team? Like, who, what, who comprises your team in terms of what skills they bring to the table? And what in sort of engagement do you have with the migration authorities themselves? And in other words, is this a project that you are doing on your own, out of the goodness of your hearts, or is this a project directly kind of linking up with or in consultation with um, the, the migration authorities? I'd be really curious to, to know answers to those questions. Thank you. Um, so the first question is about the team. So we have lawyers, case managers, and psychologists. Uh, we have adult psychologists and a, a child psychologist. Um, there are like two lawyers, two case managers, but they do not work full time. So it's like a, a, a bit of a crowd, but then again, not so much. Um, if we, uh, if you, if you ask me about the authorities, the 
the fun, well, it's the easy part about starting these pilots is that we do not seek this direct cooperation with authorities it, at the initial stage. Uh, so we just try to identify people, we qualify them to the project, we offer them support, um, and obviously we do want the authorities to, to like this idea. We do want them to pay attention to it and we do want them to, at the end, be convinced by our results and implement um, like similar models, um, maybe with their own engagement in the process. But but we start uh, without that, and we actually have a, quite a, an encouraging uh, example from the UK NGO that it's Detention Action that started really without any support. They actually started uh, fighting government and on every front that they could in, in, when it comes to detention. And as it turns out, after a couple of years, they they became like really like serious partners to the to the authorities and they have people actually being released to their project but they started really really from, from level zero so we really hope to achieve that but we're starting you know we it's just that we didn't want to wait anymore really thank you yeah i love this idea and this was mentioned in the last panel that ngos shouldn't wait for governments to act and i and i think even the ministry officials in the room would probably agree right don't wait on us to act, go out and create projects that, well, maybe not. So this is a challenge that you can address, Ava. Um, but I do like this idea of getting out in front and being progressive and, and thinking creatively. One more question, and then we've, only, we've got five more minutes, but we'll probably end earlier than that, and we'll get to you. Um, what You've mentioned this a couple of times, and, and Robin mentioned this as well, and, I've, and I have worked in this sector for five years, and I still find this... Uh, um, idea confusing, but what do you mean when you say case resolution? What are you talking about? What is case resolution uh, in your mind? Um, it's an outcome on the status of this person. So in the best case scenario, it could be a protection, international protection, refugee status. It could be humanitarian stay. Um, it could be like um, a residence for the, 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 like a marriage card. Um, going, maybe going to a safe, safe third country and coming back on a, on a visa. So like resolving the this day. But then there is the worst case scenario, which means um, uh, a negative case resolution, which is really deportation, forced or voluntary. So we are prepared to work on every scenario. So we are prepared to uh, fight for this person, but also knowing, um, assisting them and supporting them in when it turns out that nothing really worked out. And then help them and prepare them to leave um, obviously, th there is a tricky part uh, uh, with people who really are uh, asylum seekers and are honestly scared of going back. So we have made the decision to not um, suggest in any way to these people that they should go back. So it, if it's their decision that it's okay, but we as NGOs will not encourage them to go back to the country where they are afraid to go back. And this is, you know, this is something that is, is also a challenge. Um, but in every other case, then if the decision, you know, we, we will consult and, you know, negotiate and try to, if really there is no other way, then we would um, uh, prepare this person to leave. Okay, thank you so much. I see a number of questions popping up. I think we'll have time to get to them, and, and Ava's taking notes as well, because a number of them are addressed at her. But let me first open up to the room. Um, feel free to raise a hand. I'll take three or four or five questions, and then we'll, um, we'll hear some answers. Yes, Maria, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you both for the excellent presentations, and you raised many questions. Uh, I have a question uh, for Eva first. Um, for example, first of all, thank you for, um, uh, we had this discussion at, at lunch about the detention decision, and uh, I think it's very important. I'm, I'm glad to hear that Austria, uh, when you have the detention decision uh, justified in the grounds of detention, then uh, you mentioned that the alternatives are mentioned in the detention decision, and this is very important. I think this is a best practice to, to, to suggest to every state to have this. Uh, I know in Greece we don't have it. Uh, we have the grounds of the detention decision, but not uh, alternatives. If they were examined and if they were um, not considered effective, uh, this uh, there's, it, it's not in, the, in our decisions. So I think it is a best practice that we should we could highlight from this um, group. Uh, I want to ask you if uh, the, um, the 
placement and intention before uh, return is an automatic procedure. Does this happen in every case, the 72 hours that you mentioned? Is it every time? And this is also applied, I didn't understand if it's also applied for unaccompanied minors as well, except from families. And um, a question to Katarzyna. I didn't understand what is the difference. I had, I had in the past, I worked for Greek Council for Refugees. And uh, we provided this kind of services, legal assistance, psychological support, social uh, support. Uh, so how is it an alternative to detention? To, to, how is it, um, no, how is it, uh, we move from enforcement, you said, to engagement. Uh, so the person is engaged in the procedure so that he, make, he will comply with the returns decision. This is... Uh, I think th this is the, the important thing. We, you try to, to say that it's better to have engagement procedures instead of enforcement procedures, but finally, will this lead to compliance of the person to, to a possible uh, return decision? Will we, I mean, otherwise it's just providing support as most NGOs do, uh, but what's the difference from, an, from all the other NGOs that provide just support? Thank you. Hello, my name is Stefania Kulaeva. I work in Anti-Discrimination Center Memorial. And one issue that was almost not touched, I'm afraid, during the conference, is detention of children, not only when they are in a country of migration, but when they come back. So in some countries, which are members of Council of Europe, uh, actually in all Eastern Europe, um, I mean, ex-Soviet countries, children are often detained before they're sent out of the country, but when they're sent back to home, they're also detained in detention center. And in most of countries, they're detained together with children in conflict with law, in real children prisons. Uh, usually they try to do it maximum one month, but sometimes it lasts longer. And the problem is that I also, I'm, I'm still looking for an alternative that we should really insist on, on this like detention at, in a home country. Because now one country I'm very much watching the process, Moldova refused from the idea of detention centers. And as it's a country of very big worker migration, country donor of worker migrants, lots of children are sent to Moldova and they have no more detention centers. So they are giving children to families. Usually parents are not together with children, so these are so-called big families, namely any relative. And this is also very worrying, in my opinion, because people can misuse the authority over a child. We don't know who is this person who calls himself uncle, cousin, or something else. Children can be sometimes again sold to migration. Um, in this way, I have really a question, an open question, like what kind of real, practical, possible alternative can be offered? Thank you. Sorry, can I just clarify? Maybe others know exactly what you're talking about. I'm finding myself feeling a bit lost. Are you talking about, they're, upon return to their country of origin or nationality, they're detained on criminal charges? No, they're detained for administrative migration-related reasons. In other words, not, not to prevent the child from re-migrating? No, they're not accused in anything. Just like when a group of children is brought from a country where they were in migration, like Russia, for example. Russia sends children to Moldova. They're usually brought by so-called social workers or sometimes police, they used to be all police people, now they're changing to social workers, the same people usually. So they bring children, the state accepts the children and puts them where? Puts them in detention center. They are put together with children in conflict with law. And um, then slowly they find a place for them. Either relatives come, show up, or uh, it's an orphanage. And this is a big problem because these detention centers are really very, very traumatic and bad. But just what is the solution in the countries that solve the problem now by just giving them to anybody who says I'm a relative, I think is also worrying. Hi. Very briefly, I'd just like some more information about how um, this, you, you, or any more information that's forthcoming about squaring this circle about we don't want um, children in adult facilities, but we also don't want adults in, in placements that are designed for children. And it's uh, uh, an issue that we face in the UK as well. The importance of the detention decision itself, mentioning and, and listing with some specificity the alternatives. What about uh, is the... the 
detention automatic within 72 hours? Why is engagement, this is for you, Karajina, why is engagement important and does it actually lead to compliance? Um, what happens with children detained upon return? And then this last question of the challenge, how, how do we deal with um, children being detained with parents or family members versus separation of adults and children? So, no, I missed, I butchered your question. It was just around the age verification process. So if everyone is treated as a child, and they're, they're in fact an adult, you're effectively placing them within children. So you've got the same problem, but in reverse. But you've got the problem is not with that individual, but the other individuals that you're placing them with. Thank you. Um, let's start with the easy one. For me as a lawyer, it's a very lawyerly answer, so apologies to, to all the non-lawyers in the room. Uh, the 72 hours is a maximum time frame, and Austrian law distinguishes between a detention where there is a detention decision as such, it's in written form, it's given to the person, and then they are detained for the that's like an extended period of time that, that could de this detention should uh, in principle not last longer than four months. And then this 72-hour um, period is like an arrest. It could, it's done before any forced return. It can be done at a maximum of 72 hours. It depends on the circumstances of the case. Um, also where I'm arresting you within Austria because our airport is the international airport in Vienna. So this is where I need to take you. So we need to take into account how much time that will take. So it might be if you live close to there, you will be arrested 24 hours before time, or if it's a charter flight, it might be 48 hours, because um, the community will start, you know, like letting each other know there's a charter flight to this destination country, um, so to reduce the risk of absconding. And then um, that, that is the time frame for all these administrative steps of telling person, okay, do you have all your luggage? Do you need to pack something else? Does something else need to be brought to you? Are you fit to fly? Did I answer your question? Okay. But to, and does it, getting to the very top vote getter here, yeah. doesn't it just then push the absconding risk? Of course, uh, 72 it, hours it always up? does. One, one thing I can't believe I haven't mentioned yet is it's always an individual case assessment. That's like if I had to sum up in, in one word what our courts tell us, any detention decision or decision on the application of alternatives to detention has to be, it's an, a decision in the individual case. We are not, um, or we're very much discouraged or not allowed to say, okay, so in our experience, 99% of the people will abscond if we, if we inform them, okay, there will be a return operation that you are likely to be on in the next two weeks, um, and therefore we put you in alternative or in detention. If we reasoned it that way, that would be, we would be overturned by the Austrian courts. Uh, we need to look at what the person's history, if he has previously complied with orders to report to police or to show up for his hearings in the asylum procedure, um, maybe if it's a second or third asylum claim, um, what if we know where his residence is, if we, he might still be working, where the idea is uh, we can, could arrest him at his place of work. So it's all these things need to be taken into account. So, yeah, it kind of pushes the chance, and if, if I set out to not comply with a migration decision, yeah, I will, I will find a way, but it's like any aspect of life, I set out not to comply, I will find a way. Okay, so, um, since it's an, a pilot, we do not want people to abscond. So in any other activity that we would run as an NGO, we would not care about this element at all. But this is a pilot of alternatives and we are treating it as an alternative. And we want people to stay engaged with us, so to not disappear, to to stay in contact with us so that we know where, where, where their whereabouts are, uh, what they're doing, um, to, to make reasonable decisions, to be informed. So this is, this is how it's different actually from, from any other support. It may be a bit confusing really because um, when you take out this element of governmental engagement, then it really looks, you know, from, from far away, it looks like, you know, we're sitting in the office and just waiting for people to, to drop by and to give them some services. But if you imagine it as being a pilot and being tested, um, for the future implementation also in the law and, you know, at, at the, by the government, then it really, you know, it turns out to be an alternative. I don't know if I've answered your question. I want to 
pick up on that a little bit. It, again, this came from a conference where I was at in Oxford just last week. We were talking about the limits of enforcement. Enforcement itself has limitations on what you can actually get out of it. And we've learned this lesson in many other aspects, uh, and there's significant social sciences research on this. If, if you think about the war on drugs, for example, you can only punish your way out of the war of drugs so far, and then you have to start looking at um, other types of remedies or engagement-based uh, solutions to uh, drug addiction. Um, you can only criminalize uh, status offenses such as vagrancy so far, at some point in time, you have to address the, the underlying issue of, of vagrancy, meaning homelessness, a lack of money, et cetera. So, and I think in, in the same way, in the migration discourse, we can only punish our way out of this so much. So I, I, and, I, and I think we need to really look to other social sciences um, and, and other social problems that we've addressed um, for solutions. And, and certainly engagement is a strategy that's been uh, successfully used elsewhere. Let's get to some of the questions on the board. I'm not sure we've answered all of the things. I'm noting still what happens to people being detained. We haven't forgotten about you. Age determination and what happens there, but maybe we'll come back to those, or if others in the group uh, want to address some of those, please do. Um, I'll just start kind of at the top, but I, I'll, I'll see, because a lot of them are clumped together, one or two votes difference. But Ava, uh, what's the absconding rate at the House from Vienna? Well, wouldn't it be lovely if I now had a statistic on that, which I don't. Um, our statistic keeping is not the greatest. In, in general, our experience, with, especially with alternatives to detention, is people tend to comply because they realize, especially, and now I'm not, not talking so much about families with children, which is really our main topic here, but um, simple adults, they realize that, okay, this is like their, the olive branch. If they, they work with us here, then they still have a chance um, to, to stay um, in alternative, just to have to report to police rather than be put in detention. And this is also the chance to like work on a voluntary return to, to convince them that this would be the better option to go back. So, yeah. <laughs> And I think, again, this links to Robin's presentation before the lunch break when she talked, I'm, I'm going to butcher this, but Robin's here so she can set me straight, the, the sort of three critical factors in, in ensuring compliance based on, on the IDC's research is, one, th believing you've been through a fair and efficient process. So I could see how being in an open setting, engaging with officials positively would uh, contribute to feeling that you've been through a fair and efficient process. The other one was... Um, receiving social support. Uh, Robin, what are the three? I'm butchering this. Yeah. Basic needs met. And exploring all the options. Yeah, yeah. So, so a house, an open house, really could tick all those boxes if your basic needs are met. Uh, you believe you're being taken care of in an in a honest manner and not just being kind of forced out of the country one uh, sort of step at a time. And that's the third component, exploring all the options, which I think is essentially case resolution, which is what you're talking about. Not just looking at a return, but are there visa options, are there family reunification options, et cetera. Um, which gets maybe at the next question for either one of you. So what if um, someone really knows or doesn't expect to receive asylum? I think the underlying question here is fraudulent asylum uh, applications, or we could say this in a, in a kinder light. If asylum is the only legal option, so people apply for asylum because that's the only thing that they're aware of, um, can alternatives really work? And, and what kind of alternatives might work? Because, uh, okay, so I, I can just repeat what I said a bit earlier. It's not like we try not to look at it as a group of people who have like fraudulent asylum claims. So it's a group of like everybody of this group has each one, each person has their own motivations, and we just need to learn, get get to know them, um, and try to respond, you know, to what the needs are, what their plans are, and like try to negotiate um, like together the best solution for them. That would be, on, on one hand, lawful, but then again, to, to respond to what their plan, the plan for, for, them, for them is, yes. Can I add to that? Um, 
I think it's also, it comes back to this, this chance of exploring the options. It's often also things people are told before they leave their country of origin. We had an experience with a country which became visa free. And after the visa free, um, it happened on the first of a month, on the 10th, we noticed, oh, there are 60 people of this nationality asking for asylum on a Monday. And the next Monday it happened again, and the next Monday it happened again, and we started questioning, okay, what is going on here? Until we realized that there was a travel agency uh, in this country of origin that was telling people, okay, you know, you don't know how to pay your heating bill or you want some vacation, well, here we have a solution for you. Um, pay us, we will offer, you know, you're now visa free, you can enter Austria, go there, apply for asylum, the procedure will take a while, um, yeah, you don't have the highest chances of recognition, but it will take some time, your children can go to school, um, you will get some pocket money, you will get this basic care I spoke about earlier, um, and you can like spend the winter in Austria in a warm house, and then afterwards you can do a voluntary return and you will get quite a large amount of money, or for us not so much a large amount of money, but for this country of origin, quite a large amount of money per person, and then you, you can return again. And what we did once we figured out what was going on is we, um, we got together like the police, the asylum authority, and an NGO providing return counseling, and we went to them and said, hey, listen, we're very sorry, you've been lied to, here is your real options. Option one is you can um, tell us the truth about your asylum procedure, you will get a decision. Um, and then most likely it's going to be negative, so we would really suggest to you go back home voluntarily. Um, if you do not wish to do so, well, we will like, you know, play the full extent of the law and you might end up with an entry ban because you did not leave voluntarily. And that, um, of, of all the people almost, and it was a lot of people with uh, families or families with children, almost all of them accepted this alternative option, not so much to the detention because they were still in the asylum procedure and left right after again. But this can be a real challenge for member states to deal with such claims. And then the best thing I think we can do is, is like lay, lay out what are the honest options and then hope that that's convincing enough. But if it gets to the point where people say, well, I will not return under the circumstances, but their asylum claim has been examined and we have found there is no problem, then we do need to enforce this decision. Otherwise, like, yeah, well, that will be lovely. I won't have a job anymore because we won't need migration law. So in this sense, we, we do need that stick. We do need the possibilities. Maybe just to address, and I think we're kind of done with that top question, but maybe just to address also the, the idea, oh, Robin wants to jump in. Let me say something quickly and I'll let you jump in, Robin. Um, I think there is this assumption that uh, alternatives to detention don't work in, in transit context. People are just going to onward move, don't waste your time, just detain and deport. Let's not waste our time with alternatives. I'd like to offer, I mean, I'd like to offer two sort of rebuttals to this line of thinking. Uh, one, the, the research that, that some of the NGOs that I'm aware of have done shows that when alternatives are done with these sort of three things in mind that, that Robin was talking about earlier, um, if they're fair and efficient, you believe you've been through a, a fair process, your needs are taken care of, and you're exploring all the options, then actually people will stay for a limited amount of time if they think there's an option. So, I mean, if I'm going to, uh, if I'm in Austria, but I'm going to Sweden where my brother is, and you say, we're going to explore all the options with you. We can explore reunification with your brother, and we'll take care of your basic needs, and we'll treat you fairly and efficiently. I might consider sticking around for a month if I'm a 15-year-old child trying to reunite with my, with my brother in Sweden, if that's actually what's happening. So, so one, I think it's about addressing what's happening and looking at all the options available. Um, Two, I think there's, I mean, if the solution is to detain and deport, we have to think honestly uh, in terms of our solutions about circular migration, especially if we're talking about adolescent uh, children. Are we just detaining and deporting a problem that's going to come back on someone else's doorstep or even our own doorstep? And is that morally permissible, let alone sort of legally permissible? Is it the right thing to do? Um, but Robin wanted to come in and... Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'll just stand up to say to the table with a microphone. Um, what was the point of the thing? Oh, yes, I just wanted to reinforce the point that Eva made about the, the, the importance of the risk of a re entry ban. Um, 
um, one of the best uh, pieces of research that actually evaluates different strategies for managing migrants was done in the early 2000s in the US by uh, Jesuit Refugee Services. It was a controlled study with people in different sorts of um, programs with different kinds of migrant programs. And that was definitely one of the significant factors that uh, people were much more willing to return voluntarily if it meant they didn't have this black mark against their name in this kind of big international system because actually it's a highly valued um, capacity to, to uh, move across borders and they didn't want to lose that capacity for the next sort of five to ten years of their lives. So I just wanted to flag that. Yes, I see a couple more questions popping up, which is great. So I see one here, and if others have questions, I'll do another round from the floor. But yes. It's a question to Eva. Uh, you said it, it, you had to convince people to go back to their country. Um, usually, it's not a travels agency that helps people to go to Austria or to any other country. I suppose it happens. I'm sure it happens. But it's not a wit to, tr to cross borders and... Uh, also when you're an isolated minor or when you travel with your family. So after they, the families, for instance, have stayed in your, the house you described in Vienna, um, how do you convince them that the best solution for them, if they don't get the asylum, is to go back home? The home that they fled for sometimes good reasons. Okay, uh, apologies to the organizers for getting a bit off topic, I fear, because we're not talking about what, what the best way is to convince somebody to return voluntarily. Um, really, I would have to pose that question to some of the NGOs we work with, because for voluntary returns, we prefer to, like, kind of outsource the counseling because if there's a third person, it's not the immigration official that often took the decision of no, you don't get a residence permit, no, you don't get an asylum claim, then to listen to this person is difficult, so it's helpful if it's a, a third actor, but it really, I believe it's like a discussion of, okay, what are your options still? You can stay illegally in Austria for a while, you, you will face certain problems, you could illegally move on to another European Union member state, you will most probably return on the Dublin if you ask for asylum there. So in, in the end, it's just a question like, okay, how, what do you want to do with your life? And do you maybe see a chance to rebuild your life in your country of origin, especially because in, in our cases, almost all the people coming to Oscar ask for asylum and they go through the process. There is a, a court, there is a second hearing there. So I have a lot of faith in the system that we're not sending back somebody who is in a non reformant situation. So therefore, in the end, it's just like, it, it, there does come the point where we need to say, okay, the decision was made, you now need to comply with this. This is a great, actually, segue for Kat Karazina to jump in. I think there are a few questions here that essentially get at this, uh, various aspects of this. I mean, how do you convince people to go back? What's the role of NGOs in working with um, people that are in an alternative uh, detention setting, so they're not being detained, but... So, to actually, if they get a negative decision, to go back. Also, what, um, how, do, how do you interact and coordinate and cooperate with authorities? And uh, there at the bottom, are they, are they neutral to the pilot? Do they are supportive of the pilot? What's the posture of the government and how do you interact with them? And then uh, there's a similar question here. Um, how do you build trust with the government as your key partners while not losing trust of the detainees? I think that's really the underlying question. Um, okay, so as I've already mentioned a bit, um, we started out without any government support and without any gov like dialogue with the government uh, about this pilot because we just wanted to start out and we thought that initially we, we can just start with qualification and case management. We are um, positive, we want to set up a dialogue and we want to uh, convince the government to, to what, what we're doing, that it really makes sense, but I would have to meet you like in a couple of months, you know, to tell you how it went really. Uh, we are cautiously optimistic, um, yeah, but, but we, we'll just see. Um, we, we are positive that we, we want to believe that like reasonable arguments would meet with a uh, reasonable response. Um, so, um, what was oh, the, the question? There was also a question 
about um, how we are partners to the government, uh, how we could be a partner to the government and also keep the, a migrant's trust. So it really is about like cr clearing the roles. So um, our clients, migrants, really have to know what we can do and what we can't. We cannot really betray the trust. We have to stick to the confidentiality. But uh, they also have to know that um, our uh, role is maybe, like when there are governmental uh, models, maybe also interacting with the government. Um, so it's about clearing, clearing the roles with the government and clearing the roles with, with, with migrants. Um, and there was also a question about how we, how difficult it is for an NGO to assist a person when, when there's no real solution. Well, I have to be honest, it is a, it is a huge challenge. Um, uh, it, w it would help in an ideal model if this person have, had their own element of good alternatives met, so like a fair and timely case resolution, all the information. Um, but it's not always the case. So it is a challenge that we are really struggling with and um, I can't really give a simple solution. We are prepared to work with people and to negotiate and to assist them in every way possible. But that's, that's it for me. Yeah, please. Sorry, because from my own background uh, as a law student, I started working for an NGO providing legal support to asylum uh, seekers or people staying illegally in Austria. And I was really struggling with this question in the beginning. Like, what, what do I tell them when I know that like, there's, they have explored all the avenues and I just got to the point of where I would honestly tell them, okay, look, you've explored all the options. It is time for you now to think about a voluntary return. But it took me personally some time to arrive at that conclusion. And I also know that some of my colleagues at the NGOs and still NGOs in Austria are very like, no, that's not my job. That's the government's job to tell them to go home. But from a government perspective, that would be really helpful if that message was also shared and it was just an honest communication if there's no more options to tell the people, okay, this is, you can now think about going back home voluntarily or being taken home, but yeah. Yeah, we also, um, we also have to be prepared that in some cases nothing will really work and um, that's just, we, we have to be prepared and we have to accept that. But that not all mi migration cases really work out and it's maybe that we're in detention and outside of detention. So, so that's just reality. I'm just going to check in on time so that I can catch my cab. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, and I want to give these, each of our presenters, a couple of minutes to wrap up. Um, and maybe I'll ask them, Ava, at least you, there are, th I think Katarzyna has, has addressed the one at the very bottom in the latest questions, but there are three in a row. Maybe you could quickly um, address those three questions and any final words you have in a few minutes. Um, wrap ups, impressions. Um, big takeaway points, and I'll ask Karajina to do the same. And I've got a few parting words, and I'll run to my cab. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to do all that. And also um, touch upon the question from a gentleman from the UK, as you gave me that task yeah, earlier. Um, th th that's actually a, a, a question I was trying to pose. What do you do with the child where you are pretty sure he or she is not the child. And now, once again, from my own experience, I was 11 or 12 years old, and there were all these older guys sitting on me because everybody told me, you look like you're 18. So from, from that experience, I'm very cautious about just saying, oh, you look older, therefore you must be older. But then also through some of the age assessments we have carried out, there is, there is definitely cases where we then really realize, yes, this person was older. Now, our you can't even call it a solution. What we do is any unaccompanied minor um, who asks for asylum, and if the minor doesn't, their legal guardian who is appointed by the state usually will. So they're taken to a first reception center where we have a special accommodations for minors. And in that special accommodations for minors, we have kind of like two groups. The ones where we, are, we will treat them all as minors, but the ones where we're fairly certain they really are minors, and then the ones where it's like, yeah, it's a good chance that this person claiming to be 17 really is 25 or older, um, to make sure that you don't then have an adult with a child, because as you mentioned, it 
causes kind of like the same problems. But if anybody else has a, a, a good practice to share, I would very much love to hear it if time still permits us. Um, now to these uh, questions about the opinion of the child being respected when the detention of his family is considered. Now, let me stress again, the detention of the families will only be considered in those last 72 hours. Um, and there the, that's basically at the point of, okay, we are going to return you. The decision has been taken. So, I mean, that has never come up. I think if a child would come to a, a, one of the NGO workers there or a police officer and say, hey, I don't want to be with my family, I want to be in a separate room, that would of course raise question as to why maybe there is abuse within the family and that would, you know, of course start a whole like child protection mechanism in itself. Um, but from a, a, like a legal or a migration point of view, I don't really see, see much of a question there. Um, how long do the families stay? It depends on if they're in the alternative to detention. That could theoretically last for quite some time, but usually it's just a few weeks at the most, because also, uh, according to our law, if we want to think about an alternative to detention, we have to have grounds for detention. Now, in order to have grounds for detention, there needs to be a reasonable prospect of return, meaning either we already have the documents, we have the flights booked, or we have the, the okay from the state saying, okay, we will issue the documents, or we know um, this, these persons are, um, for either we already know they're from this country, or we, you know, it's like, it's not, they never claim the different nationality, everything matches, so when we go to this embassy, uh, they will very quickly issue the documents, and therefore we have a reasonable prospect of return, and then we can think about an alternative uh, to detention. Now, um, in a similar way, as to, once again, my colleague from the Netherlands described, it's not used a, a whole lot, because once again, it's an alternative to detention. We need grounds for detention. A lot of people are not even in that. They're just picked up from basic care and then um, arrested and then taken to the airport for a return flight. So I think if we have like one or two um, families a week for the actual arrest part of it, and then for the um, alternative measures for detention, it kind of like goes up and down. It, it depends a little bit on the cooperation with the embassies and all that. And last but not least, is there a decision imposing? Uh, yes, um, any alternative to detention is an administrative decision. It's um, the persons need to be heard before it's issued. That's a general principle in Austrian administrative law. It's given to them in writing with a translation, with instructions on the appeal in German, as that is our um, national language, but also in instructions in appeal in a language they understand or we can reasonably presume they understand, so from the asylum procedure. And then of course they have the right to make an appeal against the decision for, of the application of alternatives, same as they would have the right to make a, an appeal against a detention decision. However, this appeal does not have suspensive effect for obvious reasons. So I think also looking at the time, I will, I will stop here and hand over the floor. Let's start with answering the question. Um, uh, is it difficult to find professionals who cover psychological care or social care, uh, case management? Um, as I mentioned before, we do not have case management that would focus on migrants. So it is a bit like difficult, you know, it would be difficult if I just, you know, uh, uh, try to look for case managers who have experience in managing cases of migrants because I wouldn't find such person, such people. Uh, but it was fairly um, easy to find uh, psychologists that would uh, be willing to work with us and that have experience in trauma and in supporting migrants because we have like separate NGOs in Poland that would just bring together psychologists that would be specialized in these topics. So in case of um, case management, we really start from level zero and try to work our way up. Um, okay, so just like a few remarks, uh, one larger remark actually. Uh, so we talk about um, compliance and effectiveness of, of these measures that we try to implement. Um, it's obviously like a valid point that we want them to like be effective in terms of numbers because in many like for, on many for us 
numbers are what really actually counts. But we are also as much interested in raising in, in quality indicators, in what um, um, in improving the well-being of the of the person, in keeping them engaged. I know that I keep repeating this engagement, you know, many uh, many times. But this is really like the core of this idea that, for example, if you have a person who would spend um, 12 months in detention and then would be released because, uh, like, the, the return was not possible, and if after these 12 months, and if they weren't detained, and after these 12 months, that we still didn't have the case resolution, but we would have the this person engaged and you know like uh, their well-being would improve like just just a notch then it would really prove that detention wasn't necessary was it so this is like the small arguments that we're looking for and we want to bring them together and look for the stories and also bring them together and and use as arguments because we strongly believe that uh, detention in um, the majority of cases is not, is not necessary and in case of children is like should be banned at all. Thank you. Some final parting words from me and then I'll, I'll just mention this now. There's a coffee break at, starting at 4.30 and it's taking place in the hall upstairs, not the grand hall and it's not in the little place behind the grand hall where they were serving lunch, just in the kind of entryway hallway there's coffee uh, beginning at 4.30. Um, or ending, wait, the, the la oh sorry, the la ending at 4.30, thank you. Yeah, it starts at four and goes until 4.30. The last session begins at 4.30. Some, some last takeaways for me. I mean, thanks for this. Uh, um, and, and Eva Katarzyna, thanks so much for, for your valuable inputs. I would say um, it would be naive to, to come into these conversations as a human rights advocate, um, not acknowledging that there are real challenges that, that states face in terms of um, detention. I mean, I think this has become, for better or worse, a standard practice that needs to be addressed principally by states in terms of, is this the way that you want to approach the world of, of people that are non-citizens? And I think institutional reform has to come internally, and there's some hard questions that need to be asked. But of course there are pressures and challenges, not least of which is you're given marching orders oftentimes by your legislatures, and, and you have to, you, you're called on to enforce those um, decisions, whether it's a return decision or uh, whatever else, other sort of engagement with the migration procedure. Um, absconding is, is a principal concern that we hear when we talk to states. Um, and as Katarzyna said, I think other types of approaches are not necessarily known, whether it's social work or case management. I mean, these are relatively opaque uh, constructs in many countries um, around the world. But I think one of my takeaways is that there are solutions to be found if you're willing to find them. And the way to find them is one, to approach this issue, especially of children, from an ethic of care and child protection, not an ethic of enforcement. Let's, let's principally focus on protecting children and think about the enforcement later, or secondarily, as European court jurisprudence actually requires. Two, let's engage with NGOs who have their hearts and their heads and their feet on the ground and are oftentimes able to accomplish things that migration officials simply don't have the, the skills to do. Psychologists, social workers, engage with NGOs. I think you'll find them willing partners um, in this work. And, and focus on honest communication and building trust um, with, with the people that you're engaging with rather than seeing them as threats that are bound to disappoint you um, as it has been our failure, I think, in if we look at drug addiction or vagrancy laws, let's see people as, as human beings that, um, that we want to engage with proactively and positively. Those are my takeaways and my challenges to you. Thanks again to Eva and Karajina. Thanks to everyone for your participation. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you.